Uh, so we will be talking about uh, cheap seek analysis. Many things which I will be talking about are rather general, so they are applicable to other types of uh, next generation systems. Uh, something else. Oh, yeah, I should go into this. So that's now outline. So, thank you. so learning objective is written here, maybe you saw it already. Uh, so we will discuss how we do postcards after a research sequence, what we are doing to them, in order to arrive to some biology. Not maybe as a final, final biological analysis, but to some biology. How to identify those regions which are enriched, in chip seek experiments, we will try to also discuss what is actually enrichment, how we define it, right? Because that's it's actually your goal specific, your question specific, and it's not an easy. It sounds like very natural and easy thing, what is enriched, but if you stop for a second, think what it is. It's not that. Um, so that's an outline. So we'll talk about alignment, general property of the reads, negative control. Uh, how we generate coverage profile after the other weeks, uh, principle for identifying decisions and the approaches to data analysis. And what I would like to suggest, so I will be skipping, so I have way too many slides. I wanted to have them for you maybe as a uh, uh, written materials. Uh, if you have questions, please ask. And also I will reserve my right to ask you questions just to get a little bit of feedback. Um, and I will be, as I, as I said, I will be skipping some of the slides. And this may be almost redundant because already Martin uh, showed a lot on biology, what we are going to, what we, what we are studying with chip seek data. And here just a few, few comments. So there are several flavors, of course, to chip seek data. One is something which was we start with is transcription factor DNA binding. Right? When you have an antibody belong to certain protein, and then we do experiment when we, when we have this, uh, this antibody. And later, a little bit later, years later, there was antibodies to histone modifications. So we are studying this structure, which we believe is determinant of this complication of chromatin. And I really like those uh, electronic microscope images where we actually see nucleosomes, and we see the 30 nanometers. Microtubules, which is the next level of complexification of chromatin, which is also determined by those histone tails, which Martin already mentioned, and decoration of those tails is histone modifications. Yes. So that's that's a summary of the process, and again, you will be overlapping a little bit this previous talk. You already saw certain things. What I would like to to mention here, maybe, well, this step is precipitation itself, and it could be protein, histone, or to this matter, uh, libraries like DNA methylation, like NAD, right? When we have antibodies, we methylate the CPGs, and we also can do cheap CPG experiments in that way. It's actually very interesting, I say. Um, so here you have all, all steps. Uh, and then typically, at least in, in, in our center, in Martin's group, and the place where I'm working, that several levels of QC. First is QC0, which you discussed, which is QC based essentially on the sequence three. It's prior line, QC before the alignment. And then we have QC1, which is certain QCs which are after alignment. And we are going to so now, uh, this is an overview, as I said, and this is our kind of almost final result when we have reads agglomerated on top of, on top of in this case, it's human chromosome. <coughs> oh, backwards. So now, short read alignments uh, for what we have to have in order to uh, 
format. We should have reference to DOM. We should have FASTQ file, of course, of, of our interest, or several FASTQ files, read one, read two, as we already discussed. We have an alignment, aligner itself, which is this black box, and typically it's black box to all of us. It's very, very hard to understand all the little details of aligners we use, but we benchmark aligners. And I will talk a little bit about benchmarking. Uh, so output of this process, so this three ingredients, plus Q, reference, and aligner, and some, of course, alignment parameters. And those parameters, although even if some facility does alignments for you, it's better to understand, because uh, with this, uh, these parameters are critical and depends on the data. And sometimes, if you don't have mainstream data, uh, it can affect uh, the quality of your results. And then alignment file, I will be talking a lot about the uh, file and format and all, all that. Uh, there is also uh, other thing we can do with short sequence read, and some people do. We're not going to talk much, at, almost at all, in this workshop, but there is also short read assembly. People, I know that people try, even for cheap seek data, assembles uh, short reads. This is basically like stitching reads in some kind of continuous, longer DNA stretches, contigs, and then align those to, to reference genome, you know, or just analyze those. Uh, there is reviews, which is here. You can look at it, and you can think what, what, is, what is applicability of this approach. Reference genome. Reference genome usually we download from NCBI. Uh, this is the main source. UCC has its own sequence. One can download from there. Uh, it's a big file. Uh, it usually consists of A, C, G, and T, as it should be. It's DNA. It has ends. What ends means ends is means that from some other methodology, for example, cytogenetic, we know that in this location we should have some sequence, but we can't sequence through. Or in the reference, this part is absent. So when reference was assembled, there is some gaps, and in order to fill those gaps, it's approximately we know that there is like say five megabase of sequence. And then people who are responsible for the assembly, they put this five uh, megabase of ends. And sometimes the ends are short. Now, anecdotally, if you look at the genome, even in the previous version of human assembly, you can find letters different from A, C, G, T, and N. There are some this, um, this uh, redundancy code, right? So when, when we have uh, uh, purines, for example, or like, so we have, uh, letters which are responsible for multiple uh, UEPAC nomenclature when we IUPAC nomenclature. And in AD19, there are three locations like that. So if somebody, and I actually learned this uh, better way because I wrote a tool which was only knowing alphabet of five letters. And then my program broke. <laughs> and then I figured out that there are three <coughs> locations in the genome where it's not ACGT. Now, AG38 is even more complicated this way. So just be aware that it could be letters different from four DNA letters. Then also, if you look at the genome and to this matter, the genome which we have for, for love uh, contains this. There are letters in the lowercase and uppercase. It's not necessarily uh, always the case. Usually, alignment, aligners are agnostic to the upper lowercase. But this is repeats are masked, and then those uh, genomic sequences which are masked are in lower case. Now, one important thing about genome when we use alignment, the genome usually has to be indexed. And maybe, I don't know, are you familiar with indexing of genome, and why do we need it? Or indexing to any file. Indexing is a very simple concept. In a kind of simple terms, when we have a long file which we in order to access this file, we can access it sequentially from the top to the bottom. But if we want to access the middle of this long file, we need to index. We need to bring in some kind of coordinate system to this file. And that's what is done. So genome is very long. It's 3 billion uh, nucleotides. In order to access certain locations, it has to be indexed. So then we know that starting from this position, it's actually 
uh, this number of nuclei is fast, right? Then the, so I, I don't know if I'm 100% clear, but it gives you an idea of what, what is sequence. Uh, so this is just few few facts. So we, we have to deal with range of the lengths for the genomes, and the shortest one is really very short. It's five kilobase for the phi x. And human genome is three gigabase. As you know, that there are some plants which are very very long. I think one of the spruces is actually thirty long. Of course. Uh, alignment depends on the read of, of the length of the genome, and sometimes not, not really linearly. So, so the longer the genome, the longer we unavoidably need to align. So I'm not going to go into many details to, to, of, of, of the short read aligners, but just give you an idea that there are two major classes of aligners. One class is based on hash tables, and one is based on building uh, suffix trees. So hash tables, the principle is very simple. We take genome and say we have 30 basis reads. So the very natural way, how would I approach this problem? I take genome, then tabulate every 30 mer of the genome. So this will give us the entire complexity of possible genomic sequences. And then I have my file coming from Illumina with also 30 base pair reads, and I just compare. I have this big table where I have sequence and coordinates, where the sequence come from. And then I have my lookup, my, uh, this is my lookup table, and then I have my file. I take the first read from my file and try to check, is it available in the, my table? If it's available, yes, I find coordinate. If it's not available, probably it's not aligned. Or maybe there is a mismatch. That's when complications are coming. Of course, we know that there are sequencing error, the natural polymorphisms in the data. So it means that I am aligning, it's not exact match, but it's alignment with a mismatch. And then where complication comes, and that's where al al real aligners uh, work, for, uh, give work for us. So here there is a review, which is a little bit mathematical, but contains all details. Now, I mentioned already about benchmarking. So when we would like to align our data, and we would like to decide, if even if you look now, Wikipedia is, is a good source, actually. For biology, I think it's a pretty good source of reliable, reasonably reliable information. It puts this way. There is a web, uh, web um, Wikipedia site on short read aligners. It has like many, many. To decide which one to take, we would like to know their properties, and people uh, specifically published, there are several publications. How we compare uh, aligners? First, what matters to us is execution time. We have one genome, we have one file with our sequence read. How long will it take to align? And you can see there is a huge range of execution, time, execution times and its order of magnitude. And it matters to us if I wait one hour or I wait a day before the job to complete. And the second criteria, of course, is how accurate aligners are. And here we are talking about sensitivity specificity. We are talking about percent of read aligned. And second is how properly it's aligned. And what would be the good, uh, good approach to do this? What would be your suggestion? How would I will do this type of study, sensitivity specificity? So I have my human genome, for example. So if we have file coming from the sequencer, probably not the best way to use it, right? Because I don't know the result. I don't know the ground truth. So usually what people do, they generate synthetic data sets. How to do it? I take genome, and I either randomly or just bay by base shred this genome in 30 basis pieces and create artificial fast Q file. That's very easy to do, right? I just, and for every read, I would know location, actually. I would actually know where it comes from. And then I feed this into a liner with the same human genome. And I also can do uh, random, random snips to those reads and do many, many things. But the easiest just to feed it and see how many reads out of my synthetic data set will be aligned properly and how many are not. This is a good exercise. That's what people did. And as you can see, again, for properly 
there is a huge, uh, huge range of, well, not huge, but reasonably large range of uh, values, and this is percentage of align. So some, some of the aligners, for example, <coughs> bow tie, has rather good, well, bow tie, the first, the first bow tie, uh, has only 50% of reads aligned, but those which were aligned were aligned 100% correct. Now, another one, BWA, aligned 96% of reads, which is good enough number, and it aligns 96% correctly. And then there is other numbers. So you always have a balance between percentage of aligned and properly aligned. And you would like to see that both maximize. And this is more recent, uh, 2017, and the reason why I add this, because they also add the, those are academic, those are free available aligners, and they also have Nova Line, which is not free. One has to license it and buy a license for it. And multi pluses means it's good, uh, few pluses doesn't mean it's good. And you can see that, for example, this not free uh, commercial aligner has lots of multi pluses, but it has only one plus in computational time. So it really does drop very, very nicely, very, very sensitive aligner, aligns lots of reads, however, it takes a lot of time. So we will be talking about BWA aligner because it has a good compromise between precision and between uh, computational time and all, all parameters we just discussed. So this is uh, reference to BWA. BWA. Any, any questions so far about this part? No. Um, so this is reference again. Now, what parameters are important? This is more or less for every, every aligner, because those are very, very logical, common sense parameters. First of all, as Martin already explained to you, uh, even when we sequence 100 bases or 125 or 75, we never use the whole read. Uh, we never start with aligning the whole read. And the question may be to you, why? If I have 75 base mail, why I don't want to, uh, to align right away the 75 base mail? Because possibly you don't want to align with the different parts of the tool, because it has longer sequence, maybe it might be. It has longer sequence. Well, it's not like identical, but that Oh, because, of course, yes, because the chance of polymorphism is high in 75, that's one, and then we will be, we, we, we will be in troubles. The second is, you remember this plot you saw, this fast queue, right, that uh, quality winds down, so the error rate grows with the length of the read. So presumably at the tail of the read we will have higher error rate. Yes? So, I believe shorter reads are cheaper to um, that's it's. I, I think now the kit is just 75, even the small, even 100, right? The key, it's not the question, why is cheaper. Why, why, why would, because it's cheaper to have a short read, yes. Why do 125 to 300? But you are. I think, the, I think we're getting the, the seed region is different. It's different from the read itself, yes. The extension, right? So we're lining this, we should step in. So seed first, then we extend. And that's where the 100, but it's true that the incremental gain of the last, 50, you know, once you're to 100, probability you're 90, 92, 93%, so you gain a little bit more. And then, you know, so, yeah, I, I will talk a little bit about this, but about the, it's, I, I think the cost of sequencing now is just determined by Illumina Kit, right? So you, we're not sequencing yeah, short. It's different, separate, it's different. But we are still using 32. Why 32? Because, like, well, if we go shorter, it's dangerous because you can check it. Random 20 mir will be aligned to human genome somewhere. So if you just have a sequence of DNA with 20 bases and use blood in UCC browser, for example, you can align it somewhere on human genome, very likely. So you don't want to use your seed as very short. However, from all this like error, error um, rate growing at the end, uh, more polymorphism, etc. But then there is another another issue, like my issue, say computational issue. Why we would like to have our seed shorter? Because even for suffix tree, size of the suffix tree or the table, we want it smaller. 
75 basis, it's 4 to the power 75. That's the size of this table. So this is just enormous space. We would, uh, we would like to, uh, uh, to have a ta the size of the table is just ginormous. So that's why we would like to have a smaller, smaller, as small as possible. Our search will be faster. Our liner will be faster if our seed is short. But there is a compromise. So what happened after? Oh, well, this is the seed length. This is the first parameter. Now, the second parameter is number of mismatches in the seed. And the typical default is two. And well, how many, how many in human genome, uh, how often we would have polymorphism? <laughs> If, say, any of us genome will be, will be tried to align to the reference, to NCBI reference. Do you know? Do you remember? So every thousand bases we have a mismatch, roughly. Right? We have a million, about a million SNPs each of us. So probably it's not a problem for us if, if we have two, uh, two, uh, two mismatches allowed. Uh, I think those parameters come from early days. Most of the read nowadays are aligned without any mismatch in the seed. But if we have a mouse, as we already discussed, mouse which is not reference strains, and of course they're every 200, and they're hot spots of uh, polymorphisms. So we would like to have this, uh, this freedom. And uh, after we align the seed, after we place the seed, we anchor the read somewhere on the genome, then we finish the job with local alignment. The rest of the read is adjusted to this location and double checked to this, uh, with the sequence in this location by some local alignment. Um, so after we perform the alignment, we have, of course, uh, uniquely aligned reads. Yes. Yes, yes. So the C region, how do you, how do you, how do you make a genome into this, in this table? Do you go like every base and then 32 and then the next base? For hash, yes, yes. It's, you have to have any possible 32 merit, which means every base. Yes, that's the only way. Uh, so now, uh, I say we have aligned reads. So imagine, and it happened to us, it happened to me, it happened to me recently. I take the file from after alignment, and I have zero reads aligned. <laughs> what can it be? Wrong species. <laughs> Wrong species, that's a good thing, yes. Wrong species. Like, for example, the wrong genome was used. So I thought it's mouse, but well, mouse and human probably will still, be, have, still have some reads aligned, but something went really wrong. Or I used, uh, in, I, it was actually solid, uh, solid reads, but I used, uh, I thought it's Illumina reads. So it could, be, it could happen. Just check. <coughs> yes, that's another thing. If we have, if we have adapter in every single read happened, there is like 11 mere which doesn't belong to the genome. That's a problem. Yes? Why would a solid read not align to the genome? Well, because it, it doesn't, doesn't use the alphabet. It has the colors, right? It has these numbers. <clears throat> yes. Yesterday I did this accidentally. <laughs> I didn't look. I just, yes. Or day before yesterday. Uh, so unaligned reads. Uh, so that's another, 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 um, another part of the file after, after we have alignment. Uh, so luckily for us, nowadays it's very, very small fraction. Usually we are 99, 98 reads are aligned, so which, is, which is great. And uh, so when they're not aligned, we basically throw them away. Or maybe they are of some use. Maybe you had a spike in control in your, in your data. Then you take those reads and align to spike in genome. So everything depends on the problem, right? So then, uh, as we already discussed, most of our libraries, uh, even for ChIP-seq, are pair-ended. And uh, then we have another characteristic when pairs, uh, reads in pairs can be properly paired or not properly paired. Yes. Um, well, it, there is a range. Like for us, we, when we started, uh, like 30% percent 
mapping was okay, but very quickly quality become so 50, 60 percent for ChIP-seq was more or less okay number. It all depends on your problem, right? It all depends. I mean, maybe Martin can comment a little bit more on this, but amount of starting material, for example, right? What is what is your library like? What went into your library? What kind of DNA, right? So your library can be naturally contaminated. So then you're not expecting that everything will be will be aligned. But for, but for chip seek, the minimum mappability is fifty percent. Get something less than that. But there are many high quality chip seek libraries with that low of mappability. Because you've got, a, you've got salmon sperm, you've got other spikings, it's not spikings, but, but other material that's been brought down in your IP. And so we've seen libraries of, of yes. you know, but, a, but a good quality library should be 75, 80% or above, right? Well, even now we have much higher than that in the 90s. So. And of course, if 50%, but then I have 49.9, and you have this library, and you go to your PI, and yes, still we still use it, right? Of course, it's, it's a discretion. Even 30% of it can be useful. You, if you really understand what happens, and it's not, those alignments are not accidental, probably it's. There is no such point. Of course, when you try to publish it, you will need to explain why your mobility is <laughs> That's. so. So here is example, and you already saw it, of two flavors of ChIP-seq. One is sonicated, and this is the parent distribution. It's after we align our reads, and we can computationally recover the, our distribution. It should remember Agilent traces, which we observed, which went in. It should resemble, but it will never coincide because there are PCR steps involved. So don't, don't be surprised. <coughs> this is a typical, typical curve. Normally, you would like that, that Sometimes around 200 basis, 150, there is a mod of this distribution, and everything winds down at 300. What is the critical? Like when we look at the distribution like this, this is pair n. What is the critical for us? When we have several samples, we would like, and we would like to compare those samples at the end, we would like that those distributions as similar as possible. If they are different, then we will pay the price because we. This is essentially what gives us resolution of our experiment. Because in every given location, we know that the binding occurred somewhere in this range, but we don't know exactly where. So ideally, all our reads would be, all our fragments will be like, say, 150 bases long. That's it. But that's not the case for syndicated data. For native chip, for MNAs1 digested chip, it's a little bit better. And here we have a very strong peak at Exactly, when I saw it first, I was like, whoosh, 147 bases. It's exactly there. So, but yes, it chews in the spacer between nu nu two nucleosomes, and so maximum at 147. We have a little bit more and a little bit less. And here we have dinucleosome, and that's a typical, typical mm -hmm. pair. So, when pair is outside of this range, where the distance between two reads is after alignment, more than 1,000 bases, say, or they align to different chromosomes, or sometimes the distance is negative even. So can, you can imagine, right? So this is possible. One read aligned before the read one aligned uh, after the read two. This is something went wrong, but it's possible. All of those are not properly paired. And this is special in the statistics of the alignment file. This is the special information we always have. Um, so now the question is very briefly: non-properly paired reads can be indication of something interesting, actually. About by, uh, something, uh, 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 for example, we have structural variation in our in our data. It's possible, and if we have a cluster of reads aligned on chromosome one, read one aligned on chromosome one, and read two aligned on chromosome X, but they all clustered, right? So we have situation when this is chromosome one, and we have a bunch of read aligned somewhere here, and then we have chromosome X, and a bunch of read aligned here, and they all linked. So this is read one, and read two, and to this method could be one and two, they can be on negative strand and on positive strand. Then it means maybe we had a translocation here, right? We had structural variation. So maybe 
it was this end of this was joined, so we had that we had a structural variation where here's chromosome one, here's chromosome X, and our pairs were actually spanning this junction. But after after we sequence those and align, they end up on different chromosomes. So sometimes it's interesting, but if you don't expect those events, just we ignore them. So we have duplicated or multiplicated. People, people call them duplicated, but sometimes it's multiplicated reads. Reads or fragments. I, I'm using terminology for reads, but it could be fragment. If it's single, that's another argument for pair and sequencing. In single end reads, of course, we only have one read. And if it's 70 mere and our coverage is higher than 70, then for sure at least two reads will be duplicated. There is not just room to have start in a, in a distinct, distinct location for the start, so to speak, right? And I, I have it, I think, uh, on, this, on this slide, yes. So here you, you can see that if we have n base pair read lengths and we have a stack of reads higher than n, then at least two reads will start in the same location. They will show up as duplicated. This is when we have a single end, uh, single end experiment. When we have pair end, we have much more room. So although one read can accidentally have the same start, the second read, if this mo if we are actually sequencing different molecule, it's not PCR artifact, then the second read will likely start in different location. Yes? Do you, do you remove these in single end? Do you remove them? We, Remove maybe not the right, we actually, we remove them, but not all of them. We leave just one. We collapse, we call, we collapse. If the 10 starting at the same location, we use only one. We're not completely removing them because there's tons of things people can do it. Uh, in some experiments, if you really have a lot of them, you can study them, you can see where they come from. You can only consider, let's only generate profile only from duplicated reads. And are they coming from some locations of the genome? Are they having some specific sequence? Maybe it's due to some specific sequence, etc. But typically, you just collapse them and use just one copy. Um, so we mark, as I said, we mark them and we collapse them. So then, and yes. So it's after alignment. Some tools it's after alignment. After alignment, and it's the command that's removing duplicates. Are they collapsing them or removing them? Um, yes. So the first thing, so some tools, so we need to use something to mark them. And this is a actually tricky business, how to mark duplicated reads, because it's non-trivial, because you have to look up also the sequence. If the sequence itself, if start position is exactly the same, but sequence is different. There are different criteria how to call, call reduplicated. But we usually use Picard or the new tool which called Samba Bamba, and I will, Samba Bamba. Uh, I will talk a little bit about it and we will do it in tutorial. So there is this du mark duplication uh, uh, tool in these packages. So we have our alignment file, we run through this and uh, it marks. Then uh, to your questions, and some in some tools, and we are coming to this, we can say filter duplicate reads. When you say filter, it collapses, so it leaves one copy. So you have to manually, some you have to do something if you really want to get rid of. You have to do some extra. We can talk about this. If you need to do this, we can talk about this. But it's not readily available. So yeah. removing duplicates means collapsing them. But it, I think it's still, uh, we can double yeah, check. Yeah, it's in some tools, for sure, it's just collapsing. Okay. So it's taking one copy. So, so now, now uh, there is also multi-mapped reads. We already touched on this a little bit. So our genome is highly repetitive. And as you know, in human or mouse, it's about 40% are repeats. Although we call them repeats, they're not 100% sequence is not 100% identical in those repeats. There is, repeats are mutating, they're ancient. 
so, but if we take, say, 50%, uh, sorry, if we take 50 base pair long reads, then about 15% of the genome won't be unmappable. It means single end, single end read. It means that uh, in 15% of the genome, we will have similarities. So read originating from 15% of the genome can originate from somewhere else. Um, so here is a little bit of cartoon that was Martin was having for you on the whiteboard. Uh, so we have repeats. We have red reads, which are coming from the orange repeat. They can also come from this part. So while green are uniquely, uniquely mapped, those have multi-mapped multi uh, positions. And when we use uh, BWA aligner, it tells us that this read multi-mapped. There is a flag which tells us that the read multi-mapped, uh, not flag, uh, property, let's call it property, uh, in the BAM file. However, it doesn't, um, it kind of randomly tells us those. So if there are 10 positions where the read can be aligned, it just randomly give us three. It doesn't give us all. There is an option when we can report all of them, but the order of the positions also is random. So it's a little bit tricky. Now, uh, this is just what I said, two red reads coming from here, two other red reads coming from another repeat, and this is single end situation. So in single end, we have to drop all these red reads. No way we can uh, rescue those. Now, this is a pair end situation. And look at look what happened. So the green read, green read aligned uniquely outside of the repeat, another green read, and those two red reads are uniquely aligned now. So that's how we leverage pair end information. Now here I give you some numbers, and this is for mouse, and per chromosome, the blue indicates fraction of the genome which is uniquely mappable and the red is unmappable. So degree of non-mappability or non-uniquely mappability depends on the chromosome. So different chromosomes are um, having dif different, different properties. So X and Y, of course, more prone because of high synteny between X and Y. They're more prone of mixture between reads and lower mappability. And here you can see single end. So this box plot is a distribution essentially for those bars. So it's per chromosome. So the range is from somewhere from 9% uh, 9 of the genome non-mappable to up to 16%. And per end shifts by 3, 3%. So per end helps, but uh, doesn't help that much. Now, uh, this is for the reads of the lengths let's say 75 base, base pairs, which we go, when we go to 100, it doesn't help that much. 150 doesn't help that much. So the reason why, if in order to really go have a next significant step in mobility <laughs> is to uh, sequence like 350 bases. Uh, and the reason is because we, are, we have a lot in mammalian genome, we have lots of ALU repeats, which is about 300 bases. So that's, that's the thing. So we shouldn't be that greedy when we decided 75 or 100. They're almost equally OK, All, almost equally the same, either 75 or 100. And why, like, why mobility or this like knowing of mobility very well, why it's important for us? Like the question, question to you. If, like, Say, I just ignore, I get rid of those reads which are multi-mapped and don't care about them at all. Why, why it is important for us? There's several, several situations when it's important. For example, I study one genome, one particular sample, and I'm interested in absolute answer. I really want to see where on genome enrichment in my ChIP-seq library happens and where it doesn't happen and I then do functional conclusions out of this. And sometimes I see lots of enrichment, and then I have disappearing of enrichment. I have a hole. And I can say, wow, so here something happens. Here I don't have enrichment. Maybe I have dense chromatin or something, something biologically meaningful. However, this hole 
can be just due to repeat and just due to our inability to align with there. So we have to be careful, we have to, be remem we have to remember that this is possible. The second situation, when we're comparing several data sets of slightly different conditions, although I was telling to you that mappability depends not uh, significantly on the read length, it's only true after we pass 50 bases. If we go to 30 bases, then mappability starts almost exponentially, exponentially decreasing. So for 30 base pair read longs, we have 20% of the genome not multiple. So when I'm comparing library with 30 bases read uh, lengths um, in this library with 75, I will be discovering difference just due to different in mappability between these two libraries. I have alignment in one library and non-alignment in another one. So that's, that's the thing. So here in this slide, uh, we show um, uh, screenshots from UCAC browser. Most of you are probably familiar with this. It's a great tool for all of us. And there are tracks for mappability. Somebody pre-calculated mappability for us just using synthetic alignments of uh, reads to the genome. This is 50 bases, 7,500. And you can see that there is a huge uh, line repeat, about 6 kilo, uh, kilobase here. And nothing can help. Neither of read lengths 50, 75, it's the same. We have a huge gap here. However, for some small, some nuances, 100 bases are better, but not dramatically better. They're pretty, pretty similar. So let me cruise. Um, yeah, we discussed, we discussed this already. And so I had a question mark. Uh, I had a question for you, how to study, how to study if I have one library 75 base pairs and another library 50 base pairs and I have to analyze them together, what should I do? Well, typically people trim longer reads to 50, although that's kind of sad, right? We sequence it, <laughs> uh, it's, it's very high, uh, tricky to justify, but of course if one has time or one has a co-op student, one can do easy exercise. One can take 75 base pairs, align as 75, take exactly the same library, trim it, align as 50, Guillaume already suggested this approach, align as 50, see the difference. That's a nice exercise to see how many places we see the differences. It's a bit tedious, but yeah, that's what. So now, now we, we talk about alignments, we talk about parameters for the align, aligner, and now we are coming to the format of the files. Uh, so every aligner, aligner on Earth, if want to exist, stick to one format, which called uh, some format, it's a short, short read alignment, short aligned read format, SAM, S-A-M. And then there is B-A-M, which is binary aligned, aligned read format. So, so probably you are, you are already a little bit familiar with this. There is, so I put a reference to specifications, was updated very recently, constantly updated, rather clear. And my suggestion, like really, uh, can't, can't influence people much, but my suggestion, even if somebody did alignment for you and you already have those files, and if you want to work with some files, spend a couple of hours, read documentations once in your life, carefully, everything, then you know it. It's, it's your luggage then. Uh, because that's, uh, at some point it will, it will work. It will be useful. Uh, so BAM stands, as I mentioned, for the, for the binary. Uh, so we have some tools or some Bamba uh, to manipulate uh, some BAM files. Um, there is also very useful APIs. Uh, one is Java uh, from coming from Broad and another for Python when we can seamlessly read those, uh, those files. So if we have all our sequenced uh, read in a sum, uh, as a in the form of uh, sum file, uh, in the in a form of BAM file, in the binary file. Usually this compression going from ASCII file to binary file give us about five times uh, reduction in size. But still for chipsic files, this is the size of the file. So when you need a disk space, just keep in mind this. Uh, 
so some file or bum file uh, contains in two pieces one is the header and the header has information about genome which was used for aligners uh, for alignment it also contains information about aligner and all post processing for example marking duplication duplicated reads etc it should in ideal case it should contain exactly the command which was used because maybe three, four years ago, uh, three, four years later, not ago, but later, somebody wants to see what was happening and all information is there. It's very, very useful. And we will do it at the tutorial. We will look into the header of the file. This is a summary what fields of the, of the BAM file are. So first is read name. The second is just flag, which is just a number. And there is a very nice uh, website from Broad. I have a URL on the next slide, one of the next slide, where you can just uh, check mark a box, which flag, which value of, which property of the you would like, and it gives you numerical value of a flag, which can be very useful for you. Didn't exist in the early days, so you have to create on a piece of paper or envelope at the back of the envelope. Chromosome read start and I will talk about this. This created a lot of problems in the past about read start. Read mapping quality, cigar string, which give us property of alignment, give us about uh, information about mismatches, insertions, deletions, etc. Uh, which tells us about the mate read. Well, here I call mate. It's not mate reads, it's pair reads. But in the sum terminology, it's called its mate, read and mate. So it's actually pair partner. But, so don't confuse with this question about matrix. It's not. It's still parent reads, but it's called mate. Uh, inferred fragment lengths, and here you can yourself you can filter. You can see that if it's more than uh, one thousand bases, something wrong with this pair. If it's within the range, you see numbers like two hundred. The inferred fragment lengths can be negative if the read is the second read downstream. Then the read length will be negative. Uh, then there is uh, the sequence, sequence itself, and the base quality. And those are obligatory, always existing fields. And then there are some properties of the read. Maybe let's skip certain things. We, you're familiar with flags or, well, we will do this during, during the tutorial part. So there are flags and we can filter. We can filter it. We can filter those reads which are not aligned. We can filter those reads which are duplicated or collapsed duplicated reads. We can only always select only those which are. We can filter those which are ch chastity failed. Martin was talking about chastity quality um, uh, uh, um, value for for every read. We can filter on those. We can also select reads which are aligned only on a positive strand. Sometimes we want this or only on the negative strand. So things like that. And this is a website to understand the flag. This is a very nice. Maybe we can, uh, well, sometimes during later during today, you can punch this URL and to see. It it's, can be very, very useful. So the read start. Read start is, seems to be very unambiguous, very, very simple uh, property. However, uh, like read start can be interpreted differently. When we have read aligned on the positive strand, it's unambiguous. That's the start of the read on the positive strand. It's this point on the genome. If read is aligned on the negative strand, this is actually this part. This is three prime n of the read. It's not five prime n, as you would expect. And there was many, many issues in early days when people were considering this point to be this point. So actually, that's you. In order to have the actual five prime end of the read, you have to go downstream. Well, in this case, like down on, on the genome uh, by the number of bases, which is the read length. So now, when we have a single end, uh, single end read, and we extending the read by some uh, some dim dimensional way. That is important. We have to extend starting from here, not from here. Is it clear what I was talking here? Okay. 
there's still quite a few single end libraries around, people still using them a lot, so this is still maybe an issue, that's why I would like to mention it. So, and you also understand why I explain the read, why we would like to extend the read in a single, that's a usual strategy in analysis of uh, chipsic data when we have single end data, right? Because the actual DNA fragment which was, which was which was coming from precipitation is much longer. We sequence only part of it, but the binding was happening somewhere inside this longer fragment. So when we generate those stacks of read, we don't want to miss the actual binding location. And that's how we do it. We extend, for example, this average fragment length. We can infer average fragment length from the data. And if some of you are interested we can, or we have time, I can talk about this, it's not in, on my slide, how to infer from single end data, how to infer fragment lengths. It's possible, it's rather simple. And then we can extend it by, usually it's like 200 bases, and then our pile up will be nice. Not, if, we only, if we only pile up the reads themselves, we can actually miss, miss the binding location. It will be very, very noisy, but this is a way to do it. Um, mapping quality. Mapping quality is a, is a field number five, and usually we just say minus Q5 when we use some tools, when we filter, so we ignore everything with quality low than five. By doing this, we uh, discard reads which are multi-mapped or reads which are nearly multi-mapped. So lower quality, it's, a, it's the same concept, it's a FRED score there. Uh, lower quality means that read is, read is not unambiguously aligned. So, so here is, you already were introduced. Um, by the way, something I forgot to mention, and which is interesting. We spent quite a bit of time talking about base quality in the, when we, in the, in the sequencing. So I'm not aware about a single aligner, except one. Actually, the, the author of this aligner passed by like a couple of hours ago when we started our session. The person who tried to create an aligner who is going to use base qualities. So normally, BWA, bow tie to this matter, Nova line, they just ignore base quality. So you use base quality, base quality to select your reads, just say, well, I don't like this read at all, chuck those reads. However, aligner doesn't doesn't use those. So the mapping quality is based only on the property of alignment itself. So we take DNA sequence, we try to place on the genome, and deplay, de depending how well it placed on the genome, we have a mapping quality, right? Re uh, base quality is not used. Where do we use base qualities? We use them somewhere. Yes, yes, that's, that's one, of the, one of the applications. Probably there's something else. Well, it's in the extension, right? So. In, the, in the extension, I'm not sure. We, it, 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 it's using in the extension. So you see, I'm... I'm so in the seed region, basically, we're not using. Not used, but, in, but there are many parameters in how you extend the read past the, past the it's seed. It's heuristic, yes. And for example, it could be the sum of the base qualities of all the mismatch reads. So if you had a higher base quality, then and it's, you had a mismatch, you might have less or more confidence in that, in that okay. extension. So that's a parameter that can be set in DWA where it uses the base qualities, but it's true within the C region. It doesn't, it doesn't. Are not okay, so I, I, I missed this part actually. Thanks, Martin. Um, okay, so the next one is uh, cigar string, is uh, seed, uh, field number six. And this is quite useful because looking at cigar, for example, if we see 100M, and we had 100, uh, 100 base pair long read, then it means this read is perfectly aligned, no mismatches. If we see something like that, so this means certain first bases was hard clipped, for example, Nova line, this alignment, really likes hard clipping reads. So it looks at the read, mm, I don't like this bases, hard clip them, remove them, and then align the rest of it. So certain bases were just removed from the sequence. Two bases were soft cleaved, so they, le they, 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 re they were left in the read sequence, but they were not really used in the alignment. And then 
uh, there was there was this many was was marked, not no mismatches. Or 83 matches, then 35 soft clip, eight hard clip, and then there is D for deletions and I for insertions, etc. So here is nomenclature for cigar, match, reference, insertion, insertion to the reference. So this is insertion to the re relative to the reference, deletion relative to the reference. Then there is skip. This is rarely, we see rarely in the chip seek alignment, but often you would see in RNA seek alignment. In RNA seek alignment, we have tons of ends when we have intron insertion. When we have split reads, we have intron inserted, then we have ends, soft clip, hard clip. Um, well, let me skip those. I got this kind of exercise tutorial when we when we go through this cigar. Uh, maybe maybe you can do it, or we can do it as a, as a tutorial. So this is tools which we which we use to manipulate with some uh, some of bump files. One is called Santos, uh, Sambamba. Another tool, more recent tool. Uh, the advantage of Sambamba is that it's, uh, it uses multi-threading. So you can usually, any server now has multiple cores. You can run simultaneously on many cores. Your program and, or multi, you can use multi-threads for this. You can have like, 10 times speed up your analysis time. So it's, but for the small jobs, this is pretty good. So what we can do with, with both of those tools, first is indexing. So we talk a little bit about indexing genome, but we can also index our alignment file with exactly the same purpose. When we would like to access, so my file starts with chromosome one, chromosome two, but I would like to access chromosome 19. When my file index, my index contain information where to start looking into the file. It will be really instant. So instead of going through the whole file, if I have index, I will look at chromosome, ni chromosome 19 right away. Um, so the next, the next one, we can, we can a edit, we can do some file activation, we can view, we can calculate statistics. We can ask, how many files are duplicated, how many reads are duplicated, how many reads are not out. So here it's a summary, so we can see floods, it's explained floods, we can do lots lots of things with this, this is samples. So any any questions so far about manipulating the uh, Another tools which we, we are using and will be using Picard tools coming from broad, uh, and mm -hmm. one of the tool is mark duplicates when we marking duplicates, and uh, another, for example, we can merge usually or sometimes we can have data coming from several uh, sequencing uh, runs, and we would like to merge them together. The example would be I have a trial run. I see that my data is okay, I sequence more, and then I merge them together. And we would like seamlessly merge them because we would like that reads from chromosome one uh, merge together, which reads from chromosome two, etc. So uh, the merging can be done with Picard or with Samba Bamba. Samba Bamba. Uh, for visualization, after we are done with alignments, we would like to visualize what happens at I think we are we trusting our eyes a lot, so we would like to see the data. That's the first thing I would like to see. Although how much we see, I don't know, but we have an illusion at least that we see something. But look, we can't we can't study the entire the genome, visualize the entire genome. It's very difficult. Uh, but we generate a file in certain formats, which are visualizable in IGV or Bosch U genome browser, or it's called Epigenome browser, I think and you see C genome browser. Uh, and we can visualize at different levels. We can visualize at read level or at read pileup level when we lose read identity, but we only, we only look at the coverage. At every base, we know how many reads are covering this base. Right, so we are losing individual reads. 
when we look at the elite level, we can study, for example, SNPs or insertion deletions and all little details. At the pileup level, we look, we lose this, but we see a little bit of better global picture. So here I show you example of pileup, and this is six marks, six epigenetics, six histone modifications, uh, ACK27 acetylation. I think it's yes, it's for human embryonic uh, stem cells. Actually, the data we are going to look at. Uh, HCK4 in the one, HCK4 in the three, HCK9 in the three, K27. So you see, we look at different pileups, we look at the uh, input DNA, which is control, and this looks pretty uniform, covering the entire, how much it's, it's here, this, I think, six megabits, almost six, no, 500, sorry, half. Half of megabase, right? This. So the entire thing is one megabase. So it's pretty uniform. Other marks showing different stuff. And there is two uh, transcription factor binding experiments, which are, look very different from sheep seek, which is like peaks, very sharp peaks. So basically, that's our visualization. We look at this, and it looks reasonable. And yes, yes. So, so well, this is this is just raw coverage. Of course, after we generate, uh, like, so what we are doing there is the following. We <coughs> we have our reads aligned, and as we have pair end libraries, we have our pair reads aligned. So we have our fragments. And our fragments have different lengths. And if this is my genome, this is fragments. They align like that. And then maybe there is single read aligned here. And then we generate coverage profile. So essentially, we generate coverage, which will be, so here is one read. Up to here, it will be one, then it starts two. Then here, we have three reads. And then first, we have four reads. And then four reads stops. And then it's three again. Or actually, it's, it's very little three. And then it drops to, to two. And then there is two reads. And then there is one read. So that's what we see there. Yes, if I zoom in, and I probably in the further slides, I'll have something, something to zoom in. That's the profile we see here. So in, usually when we run conversion of BOM file into the weak format file, this is a called weak format, we just get those integer numbers. Now, the total number of reads is different. If I have library one and library two, I can have different number of, total number of reads. Of course then, um, if I really, really look at the number on the left, in one case it's 160, and in another it will be 20. It can be a little bit misleading. Yeah. Because so if you have, if you're comparing with, like, so suppose if you have an author and you have an author, right, and you see a decrease, but you still see, like, you know, there are, like, different numbers on the left, you know, right? but... Yeah, there, there's lots of complication. I, I guess we still, we can have way out, and the way out is simple. We can either do some normalizations, but let's talk a little bit later about normalizations. It will never help us 100%, because in order to normalize property, you will be asking, okay, should I normalize on the background reads or on signal reads? And if I normalize on total, what is signal to noise in my library, right? So many, many things. But what I can see, I can look at the my truck, and I can see are my peaks distinct from my background? If they are, then my library is okay. Even if the absolute number is 160, and say, imagine that this, uh, this other library, like say, I don't, I don't see the number here, but let's say it's basic. But still I see clear distinction between peak and background, between foreground and background. Then 
it's okay. If my library, my IP library looks like that, this is input. It has some kind of peaks, but it's very dirty. Then I'm failing. I think we, we should cruise a little bit. We have half an hour, but let's. So this is about visualization. Uh, are you familiar with bad, form, bad format, BED format, or maybe a few words? Because here there is some, some, some tricks and some gotcha thing. So if you, if you look at the, the nicely described that you see, see browser, there is nice uh, frequently asked question page, and all details about formats are there. So bad format is basically chromosome start then. So that's for visualizing objects which are just genetics, uh, genomic segments. So when I have something, for example, exon, which has start and end and chromosome, that's where I use bad format. Bad format has three columns, chromosome start end, and it, has, it can have some other column name. Then there is a bad graph format which is similar as bad, chromosome start end, but it also has score. It has some amplitude. So for this fragment of the genome, I have certain number attached to it. Now, what is the problem with this format? It's zero-based. In most cases, that, what means by zero-based? When I say, uh, so and here, here is, is an example. So if real coordinate is 400,601, in the bad file, the number will be 400,600. I don't know why they did it. Of course, mathematically, it doesn't matter. If you know the rule, you know what to do. But for the like, regular person, it looks, OK, this is my coordinate. I would assume that here my segment starts. But actually, it starts one base later. Where, where is matter? It matters, for example, I have a file with coordinates of CPGs, just dinucleotides. And all of a sudden, I see that there are three bases instead of two. So those, those things one has to remember it, it can be. Now, other formats, also from UCSC, they are not zero base. They are so-called one base. One base would be if there is one here. So this is bad format. Very simple. Chromosome start end. And it's like a column. So you can have millions of these chromosome start ends. You can load this file at UCSC, and you can see something like, I have an example here. No, I don't have example. Later, I'll, I'll point you to example what was the bad file visualizing at UCSC. So now, another important uh, visualization format is weak format, is to visualize exactly those coverages. And it's done in order to compact, in a compact way, to visualize those coverages. We will talk a little bit about this during our tutorial. We generate, actually, this file. Hopefully, we'll have time for this. And maybe let's talk about this format later. This is very unusual format for us. It tells us where my cluster of reads this starts. Because imagine, like in this example, I have cluster of coverage. Then I have nothing up to this read, right? And I have another one. And then maybe I have nothing again. And maybe I have fragments here. And then I have another cluster. But then I will have gap. So in order to have a reasonably small, in terms of size, file, I only detect the start of this cluster and the coverage within the cluster. Then the next start and the coverage. The next start, it's very logical, right? And that's how the weak format is organized. The bed graph I mentioned, so it's, again, it is uh, chromosome, start, and, and then some score. In this case, it's just coverage. Now, to generate the weak file from BAM, we will be using the our tool, which uh, we created. Uh, there are probably some other software tools to convert aligned reads into the, into the coverage tracks. Uh, now, the interesting complication here, just for you to be aware, sometimes uh, when we feed the genome, into our aligner, aligner doesn't care how we name our chromosome. We can call chromosome one apple, chromosome two peach, etc. It will be totally fine with that. Uh, now, UCSC browser does care because it has its own nomenclature. It knows what chromosome one, what chromosome two. Now, sometimes our genome, instead of CHR1, <coughs> has just one. 
in the FASTA file. And then when we get our aligned reads in our BAM file, which we discussed, in the third field, which is chromosome, we will have one. Then we convert, when we convert in the coverage profile, again, chromosome will be called one. We try to load it to, to, into the UCSC, that unknown chromosome, I don't know it. Because at UCSC, chromosome one is known as a CHR1. So this one has to be just be careful with that. Um, so now we are coming coming to the questions of analysis. And uh, usually the question we have or our supervisor has, find me in rich regions. That's, a, that's alignment, find in rich regions. And uh, like we can, we can ask, of course, uh, what are in rich regions? And let's talk about this a little bit in a few slides later. What are in rich regions, actually? But it can be one of the pro. We have just one data set, and we would like to find all regions which are enriched for this data set. The second, uh, we know where to look. We are not agnostics. In the first, we're just agnostic. Genome-wide, find the niche regions. In the second, we know, so, so to speak, regions of interest. And it could be just uh, because of experimental design. And we would like to compare and look only in those regions of interest. And sometimes it can simplify our analysis. For example, our regions of interest are repeats or LTR, LTRs. And like if we just do normal alignment, we talk already, those are repetitive regions, which will be multi-mapped, they usually tossed away. But if we are only interested in repeats, we can design the way we are looking at those so that we can study those repeats. For example, instead of looking at genomic location, we are looking at repeats families. We agglomerate all genomic locations which are uh, belonging to certain Earth, and we look at, at the one one region of interest. And then the next one could be, potentially, we could do a comparative between different marks for the same cell, same mark for different cells, etc. So now this is like, and I, I don't know, uh, maybe it's just me, but I had a hard time to convince myself and understand what are in which regions, in which relative to what. And the kind of, simple but probably probably right way of looking at this is the following that we look at the locations at the genome which are different from other locations and not due to technical re, technical issues but truly biologically different to other locations on the genome and that brings us to the uh, to the following so if we have ip where 90% of the genome is actually positive. So our antibody is sensitive to the 90% of the genome. Is it a good study? Probably it would be very, very difficult to interpret because we're almost looking to into anti-enrichment. We almost want to search for the locations where IP was not happening. So this is something to keep in mind. So the first one, locations which are different from other and the genome. However, now, we have a control, almost every IP experiment required to have a control now, and it's typically it's DNA input control, where we sequence read, which pass all steps of sequencing, library construction, alignment, all steps are the same, except using antibody, right? That's the only step which is kept. Um, so we have input, we have control, and we would like to see that those regions which are special in our IP are not special in the control. That's how we are looking at, at the data. And that's how um, uh, peak color, they still call peak color algorithms, are essentially approaching the problem. Yes? So for MEDIP, some people I know that they don't use MEDIP. For MEDIP? Well, it depends. Uh, often, yes. I, I know that Martin doesn't, doesn't sequence input, and almost everybody doesn't. But I, I saw data where people did sequence input. And input is used for the same uh, 
like let's come to the usage of input and we, we can discuss it. So the question is what is what is the ideal input ideal control? Probably different people have different opinions. There are publications. Uh, input control seems to be DNA input con uh, as a control seems to be good enough. It's easy enough assay. It's cost effective. Many people are using it. For ME deep, yes, let's talk a little bit later. So now, why to use input, DNA input? So now, these are exactly the same data set which you already saw. This is those profiles which we discussed. And you see something like that, all the marks. Now, of course, if we have six marks in C picture like this, probably each of us will be a little bit suspicious of what's going on there. Because we have identical profiles. But imagine I just sequence one one mark, or I have one, uh, one IP, like this one, and I'm perfectly happy with those peaks. I have very strong enrichment there. Now, the black one is DNA input, and DNA input has exactly the same enrichment as our IPs. So this definitely tells us that it is alignment artifact happening there, and fair enough, there is repetitive region. By the way, here you see a C track, this is from uh, so this is chip seq data, K27 acetylation, I think, from many, many cells in the end quad. And they also see enrichment here. So that's allocation in the human genome, where we always see the reads. <coughs> so we use DNA input to read those away. Those are alignment artifacts. That's another example. So those alignment artifacts are not only specific for humans, they're also in mouse. So alignment artifacts coming, we don't understand exactly trying to research those a little bit, but they're there. They're probably due to our not knowledge reference genome and the individual specificity of the sample relative. So there is, if there is low, uh, low copy number repeat, so there is more DNA coming from different locations, but in reference genome, it's just one location. It's aligned in one place, and it piles up there. So it's pure artifact of the alignment. And why it's dangerous? Because having those, we will have a mistake. We will erroneously call places which are enriched. And although there are not that many, maybe there are several thousand genome-wide, and they are less than 1% of the genome, but they are very persistent and very consistent between different experiments. So we'll, we can have some kind of discoveries by not removing those artifacts. So here I'm showing you in the log scale on the y-axis is log of the coverage and on um, uh, x-axis is chromosome 1. So you can see that the coverage is pretty uniform, the black. However, there's those reds, red uh, towers, which are actually alignment artifact. So in some locations, we have this huge coverage. It's because it's very, very high coverage. Just technically, we have variability there, which is also bad. But also we see that, say, in this sample, which is, uh, which is colon, we see artifact here. It's human. In another human, in another mammary gland or thyroid, we don't see it here. So this is sample specific. So if we just did those artifacts, we found them once and would like to use once and forever, we will steal only about like maybe 80% of those artifacts will be taken in account, but maybe even less. So it is somewhat individual specific. Let me skip this. Um, now, uh, what, are, what are challenging? So, so we used our input. We removed alignment artifacts. What are next challenges? Next challenges, as I said, is to find enriched regions. Uh, can we use input as our background? Question to you, and I ask my question myself. No. We cannot, and the reason why we cannot, because, well, first of all, input is still slightly, is different experiment. So background is somewhat different. Uh, why, why, what else, what else, what will be else argument why we can't use input directly, compare our IP to input? Because our depth of sequencing is different. Our total number of reads, we don't actually know what, although presumably the True background, 
very, very unspecific. So still remember that our, uh, uh, in our IP, it still reads which were pulled out with antibody. They are likely non-specific, but they will still function to the pullout. In our DNA input, we didn't have this step. So uh, we also don't know what is the fraction of my background in IP. And we have, like, say, 50 million reads sequenced in DNA input. What is actually fraction? How many reads in IP? We sequenced IP to also sequence million reads or sequence million fragments. What will be fraction of, of uh, background? And it depends on many, many uh, parameters. It depends on the type of antibody. It depends on the quality, on the signal to noise, etc. So just comparing input to uh, IP, we cannot. Now, if I would know which fraction of my reads in IP is actually background, I can try to subsample my DNA input to this number and to use it. But I don't know this fraction. So that's, that's uh, why it's, it's difficult. And uh, we also don't know, of course, for the IP experiment, we don't know analytical form of neither, neither background nor signal. So to this matter, I think the cheap seek analysis is the most complicated. It's more complicated than, for example, SNP calling. I, I don't know, you, you probably would, like if we look at the SNP, at the whole genome shotgun. So we have, we have read, reads aligned. Um, we have stack of reads aligned. And in some position, we have in the reference genome C, and we just look, okay, what happens in our reads? C, C, and then we have A, A, C, and then maybe another A. And then we just count. And then we, if we see we have 90 reads stacking in this location, and out of 90, 55 are C, and uh, 35 are A. So although it's not 50%, but close enough, there is some statistical model. We can rather simply infer that there is probably heterozygous SNPs there. If it is like two A's, we will question it. But there is a clear statistics, in this case it's binomial, it's like a dice. We honestly throw dice with, with two numbers and we see how many times it's A, how many C, and we can assign p-value and we can have a conclusion here. The same is RNA-seq. We have very little part of the genome, less than 1%, say, which is coding where our reads supposed to fall. And then we have some background, of course, but we just counting reads in our exons. And everything what we count is essentially we use for quantification of expression in comparison between libraries. It's easy. In ChIP-seq, uh, we have a lot of background. We have a lot of biases coming at every single step of this, one of the first slides we had. and. This is a problem, right? We have to decipher. Uh, so when we have a little bump, this bump is just due to fluctuation of our background, or it's already start to be significant enrichment. That's what we are doing, uh, analyzing cheap seek. When we talk about peak callers, uh, many, many tools are available. And there is a, I, I can say, heroic efforts of many, many groups in the community which people try to address this question. And many of those really nice tools actually failed. And they failed. Uh, one of the reasons is that people honestly address the problem. They create a tool. They use them for their own analysis most of the time. They even see that for their own data, it performed better than some available tool. And more or less, that's it. Because they didn't do a um, tool which would be for, available for production or conveniently uh, used by other people. So there is one tool which kind of, uh, which, which is, uh, which is um, uh, winner of this game at the moment, which is Max. I will be talking about this tool later. And uh, people, people at, the, at the table here, all, all of us are involved in ChIP-seq tool development. So we'll mention, mention this, this as well. Um, so maybe, a uh, few, few, few words about, about the 
uh, the peak uh, peak calling. And unless maybe you won't interrupt me with some questions at the moment, or any yes. <coughs> Yes. Yes, I can. I can. Let me. Let me. Let me think how better do it. Um, let, let's let's go through to the process, and I will be mentioning some biases during, and then we during the, this, and we can. Yeah, we can. Be, biases are very very important. That's in it. Yes. Yes. Uh, what do you think is the major bias, or one of the major de kind of common determinant bias for? Um, probably the um, specificity of the protein. Well, antibody. Yeah, antibody. This, antibody. this is one of the one of the yes. Of course, the specificity of antibody and like crosstalk between two antibodies. Like say, I believe this is HCK27 ME3, but apparently HCK36 ME3 mark will be also sensitive to, like, say, 20% specificity to this antibody. And that's the curve which Martin showed, right? You saw that there is HCK4 ME3, which is the easiest antibody. It's 90% specific, I think. And it has still, it can pull other modification. This antibody also sends other, anti other modifications. But it's only a few percent. But if it's 30%, that's already dangerous. So this is one of the biases, yes. And this is bad bias because it will, it's, not, it's not kind of uniform. It is location-specific bias, unknown location-specific bias. This is not good. Another bias which I will be talking is GC bias. And GC bias is a little bit of a common denominator of many biases because this comes into sequencing. This comes into all kind of amplification steps, which are not maybe sequence or not sequence-related steps. And uh, so this is one of the one of the biases which is important and can be positive. It can be negative. What is another? Sorry, you have a question. Yeah, um, I don't know if that's like what we've just going to talk about in the next few minutes. Yes. You mentioned that we cannot just like subtract the input because like the reading that could be different. Yes. If I look at the chip seek data and just look at the peak, I always just go down and check all the marks and just kind of look if there's a peak as well. So I always imagine that the well, When you look is okay, right? And yeah. when you look, how do you, our eyes, what, what, <coughs> what we actually will be looking when you yeah. look? We look that we have a peak, yeah. then we look at the flank of mm -hmm. this peak, okay, it winds down, nothing. Yeah. And then I look at the input. Input, I look at the flanks, mm -hmm. this level, I look under the peak, also yeah. nothing. Is that However, kind of what the algorithm is doing? So just well, like this is a principle, but yeah, this is a principle. This is a principle. No, okay. That's our general principle. Mm -hmm. We look at the enrichment in the location A, so it's different from the flag. Mm -hmm. We look at the input; it's not different. Okay. However, you can't do this directly. Yeah, yeah. You can't infer flanks by eye. We can determine mm -hmm. where is flank and where is P, and we have to teach our algorithm to do this, and we have to do this within the IP itself. Because the level in input can be completely different from the level in, in, in our IP. So it's more that you like, calculate in your sample, okay, it's like a 40% increase to this other region, and mm -hmm. then you go into input and say, like, here I only have a whatever, 2% Some, increase? Something like that. Okay. Some, it's very logical. <laughs> yeah. Exact algorithm may be doing it slightly different. Mm -hmm. Exact algorithm tries to optimally uh, discriminate in your IP genomic locations which are likely enriched mm -hmm. versus genomic, like, uh, genomic locations which are likely input, mm -hmm. compare those, mm -hmm. require that discrimination is maximum or optimal. Mm -hmm. Then look at the input, uh, look, sorry, look at the, what was called background, yeah. compare with input, and see that it resembles input. This would be ideal scenario. Mm -hmm. Resembles input in terms of the distribution. Mm -hmm. Not exactly, right? Because we can have 5 million reads, background reads yeah. in our IP, and 50 million in input. Mm -hmm. Because this is count statistics. Yeah. Those are Poisson-like processes. Mm -hmm. 
Poisson distribution is not like normal distribution. Normal distribution is symmetrical distribution. Yeah. We shift it around, it still stays the same. Poisson with a low coverage has a long tail. Mm -hmm. Right? It, yeah, it looks, I yeah, it looks like that. If we have Poisson with low with low mean, it looks something like that, very asymmetrical. Now, when our mean is 50, say this our mean is 2. If our mean is 50, our Poisson will look almost like normal. Yeah. So we can't really directly, we need to do a lot of scaling and if we want to directly compare input. So that's what all these three yes. colors do. They, they, they try to do something along these lines, that's right. But not using input directly to determine property of your background. Mm -hmm. That's now I'm very yeah. precise in what I'm saying. Now, when you visually, visually, and there are tools even, which are visually like analyzing, analyzing those peaks. You can do it. The question is, when you have 100,000 enhancers, will be a little bit hard to do it for each and all of them. So you have to train your system somehow, and then still and that's what it's doing the do some. Well, you, train it how it's you train on some locations maybe, and then you try to analyze the rest computation. Okay. So that's well, the tool that does exactly that. Yeah. So you look yeah. at a few different <coughs> based on that, and that's how it runs. You can, no matter what, there are some parameters to tune with all these E colors. Yeah, yeah, I always see that, like, those tools are developed, and, and I just can't. And on, on, top of, on top of this, of course, we all a little bit subjective when we look. Second, the UCC browser make us subjective because there is a pixelation, right? When you look at the picture and you whoa, that's a perfect peak. And then I zoom in, zoom in, and I see like a commy, dinky structure there. When it's, because, uh, because uh, it's, a, it's a pixel resolution, right? So it's, it's a tricky, it's a tricky, tricky thing. Now about biases. I want to throw one more bias because we talk about biases. Uh, digestion and syndication. Now, like this introduced bias as well. We know that actually genome is not a one string. It's wrapped in a very complex 3D structure. Some is heterochromatic. So it's very hard to sonicate, for example. So there are some locations which are hard to sonicate. However, there are some locations which are fragile. When we have a fragile location, we have break occurring in this location more frequently. And then even in our input, we will, have, we will grow a peak, which is, will be uh, just spurious peak. This is a bias. Unfortunately, sometimes we have biases, for example, in nucleosome-free regions. And we know that at transcription start site, exactly at the transcription, transcription start site, where we often have a mark, like a 3 k 4 me 3 or we have transcription factor, some protein binding in our promoter. We have nucleosome-free region, and we have frequent break. So we will grow, if we look, if we profile input around TSS, and I, I think I have this, uh, you see a peak there. And it depends on the technology. Misha, you're about five minutes. F five minutes, yes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's, we, we talk many things already, which, which I'm going to talk. So here is just some complications that we have to work with data. We still use word peak color, but we actually analyze it, not peaks. We, we're analyzing uh, peaks, which are punctated or localized marks. And we, then we have dispersed. And, uh, and I, I don't think we have it in your... So some of, the, some of the slides are not in your printouts, but they will be in PDF online. So everything, so updated version is online. So this is three pictures, three images. They all come from one megabase of human genome. And you can see one mark is perfect, like peaks. And another one have almost half a megabase regions, which are, which are enriched. And when we call enrichment, I don't think we can call those peaks. This is, and this is HCK27 ME3. And then if you look in, in HCK4 ME1, ME which is enhancer mark, it's very complicated because it's a mixture. So sometimes it has 
very strong cluster of enhancer probably, or maybe it's a, like you heard this super enhancer, the word, where we have a stretch of DNA which is covered by binding sites, uh, and then we have a really localized peaks. So we have both. So why is the problem? Typically, when we analyze the data in every signal processing task, people like to have a scale, a single scale. At what scale I would like to look at my signal? And here we have multiple scales. That's what creates <coughs> the problem. However, biologically, maybe we have a single scale. And this is for you to think, it's a homework to think, it's I'm thinking about this, we're all thinking about this, is what is actually scale of the histone modification? When we have an enzyme which is a writer of histone modification, how many nucleosome, juxtaposed nucleosome it can affect? It can't affect half megabits, that's for sure. So it probably affects several. And what is happening here is just spreading of the mark. But it consistently happening for millions and millions of cells. So what tool to use? That's a personal questions. <laughs> well, uh, now we can, as I also already was talking about this, we can have single data analysis or we can have uh, multiple, multiple uh, sample uh, comparison. I would like to show you some interesting exercise we've done with mouse data when we just look at the signal at the promoter, and I probably have already two minutes, not five, uh, we have at the promoter of the old genes of 20,000 genes and calculate row signals there. What by mean I bought row signal? Integral of the reads, read count in the promoter. And then, because it's, I took one uh, plus minus from TSS, 1.5 kilobase, through, through three kilobase, calculate signal there, and um, compared with three kilobase random genomic locations. And let's see what we see. When we look at input, the blue curve is genome white, the red curve is promoter, we have exactly the same peaks. And what it is, it's nice, right? So input and promoter look exactly the same as input anywhere else. So we don't have much biases when we look at the 3KB resolution. When I look at HCK4 ME3, that's interesting. I have genome white, which is blue, which, is, which has almost zero signal, and then it winds down. And then in promoters, I have a strong signal. And almost looking at this data, I can by eye set a threshold. So I can say that, do I need a peak color here? If I just have one data set, probably not. I can just plot this. I say everything above like 10 is my signal. All promoters which contain, which have signal above 10 are marked and everything below this is not marked. It's very transparent and easy. Now, if I look, it's not always that easy. If I look at K9 ME3 mark in promoter, for this mark, I don't expect, this is not mark which marks genes. I don't expect a strong signal there. So, and that's what I see. My signal in promoter red is anti-enriched. Genome white, and I expect those, it's heterochromatic mark, it's repressive mark. I expect those around repeats. And I see genome white, the signal which is blue, stronger than that promoters. It's anti-enriched. Now it's interesting, Mark. It's CK20 polycom, it's CK27 and it's three. Again, it's anti-enriched, genome white, blue curve is stronger peak. The red peak is almost at zero. However, I have this long tail. So there are some promoters, some genes, which have strong HCK27 ME3 signal. And those are repressed or bivalent, bivalent genes. And uh, here is a heat map which shows correlation between, again, just calculating signal in the promoter, no sophisticated peak calling, no nothing, HCK4 ME3 versus HCK27 ME3. Mostly they are repulsive. So I have promoter with this mark or I have promoter with this mark. So very strong K27, uh, very, very weak K4 ME3 and vice versa. And we have those dots which are about 1,000 bivalent promoters which as, as expected. Let me, you have all this in your uh, handouts. Let me 
skip. So here's interesting, another orthogonal way to look at the data, where instead of calculating signal in every promoter individually, we look at the profile around TSS. So this is profiles, and this is a typical picture. Uh, seven years ago, one can publish those. Now it's almost like a QC plot. Um, so you see different profiles. Um, I, oh, what is interesting, the black is input at TSS. You remember what I said. We have a peak in input at TSS, and this is just because of nucleosome missing there, and we have easy sonication. So I'm more or less done. I'm showing you, showing you also the clustering, which we can do uh, with just the signal itself, HCK27 ME3. This is Ramsey roadmap, uh, uh, NIH roadmap data. And what is interesting is that with this mark, we can really cluster cells very close to the cell of origin or to the germ, uh, germ layer of origin, which actually makes us think that maybe it is. It is true what Martin, in his introduction, that epigenomes is determinant of a cell, uh, cell uh, fate. So that is good. I'm almost uh, so just mentioning the tool which we are developing, which is Finder. And maybe we can, I don't know, Anne, can I eat five minutes from the lab, from the tutorial instead? Maybe everybody wants a break now. I will be only a couple of slides uh, be before we start next. It will be also good. Um, so, so it's, again, you have to deal, listen to me. I continue talking uh, with the same slide. So basically just, yeah, come back. So what I was saying here, that very simple exercise, quite a few, I think more than 60 different primary cells from an NIH roadmap. We look at the profile, which we, we, we saw multiple times already. We took TSS of coding genes, very, very, very crude actually. We just took major transcript of the gene, uh, TSS, calculated signal there, uses a vector, cluster, unsupervised clustering, hierarchical clustering. Uh, you probably familiar, all of you. That's a way of looking at the uh, relationship between different data sets, and it clusters, clusters really nicely. You can see. Uh, all kind of H1 embryonic plus IPS and H1 derived cells as a tight cluster here. See, very separated from anything else. There is a blood cluster, there is a brain cluster, there is some uh, liver, kidney tissues, uh, etc. So I think it's encouraging. Uh, then, like a peak color, so I just few words, I, I guess it's bad and maybe also good, I talk about something which I understand, which I was uh, thinking about for a couple of years. Uh, it's, it's a finder. Uh, we had a tool uh, published uh, some years ago which called Find Peaks, which was developed in a very early, it was kind of a, uh, from necessity. We had to analyze ChIP-seq data and uh, this tool was based on the principle of whole genome shotgun sequencing using statistics of whole genome shotgun sequencing. However, these statistics broke uh, when we look at the modern, uh, modern ChIP-seq data and we started developing something else with different, different statistical model. Uh, so this tool uh, is simultaneously analyzing all, so it's written in Java. I start from maybe from the end, so it's pretty fast. It simultaneously analyzes several marks. So if you have six marks, you can just run all of them. Uh, what it does, it in, like we talk a lot about mobility, but in real life, how to detect mobility, that's a big question, right? Because we can't really, for every experiment, for every read length, we can't really run the synthetic data set and determine mobility. So in this particular case, find their infer mobility from the data itself. And it uses a very simple trick. Like imagine we have our pair end data aligned on the genome. We have six different marks plus DNA input. So we have seven different data sets. Then we bin our genome, let's say 75 base pair beans. And we look at the middle of fragment falling into this bean. And then we look at those beans which have zero count 
in all seven assays. Those we call unmappable. Even if they are mappable, they are not useless for us. They are not useful for us at all. They are completely useless. There is no data there in either of those seven data sets we are analyzing. So that's how we call it not mappable. Now, input is pretty uniform. Input, of course, is not whole genome shotgun. It's not as deep. It's not like 30x. But it is like 4, 5x, maybe, sometimes. Depends on the depths, but sometimes it's pretty deep. So it's uh, input for sonicated or, in particular, digested input is, of course, an interesting, interesting creature because if we start, if it's deep enough and we start calling peaks on input, we will see single nucleosomes. So it's actually, like, this is one of the things which actually broke our old fine peak tools that the quality of the data become, become too good. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a problem. So instead of having input just reads which are randomly and nicely distributed, we actually, in input, we see something like that. We perfectly see nucleosome positioning. And if we, if we have MNAs digested data and we do Fourier transform, for example, we analyze the frequency, the periodicity in this data, we perfectly get a single nucleosome periodicity there. So let's just be aware about that. Uh, so now find there's in first unmappable reads, but it can also, we can input. If somebody comes to me and says, well, this is my file in the bed format, chromosome start end, which give me unmappable genomic location, I can also take it and read it. Then it it does uh, this alignment artifact. Um, it calculates alignment artifact the way, the way I uh, showed you the pictures. Now, the important things probably is that it takes into account GC bias. So it uses uh, DNA input. And like maybe using whiteboard, I will explain a few things about GC bias. If I look at 75 base pair beans genome-wide, I can calculate GC content in every bean, right? I can just count nucleotides, how many A's, how many C's, how many G's, how many T's, sum C plus G divided by 75, and I have my GC content. If I plot it as a graph, so here's my GC, and here is 100, 100%, and here is zero, then I will have a peak looking like that. So it's around 40% will be so it's like that. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, it's, we don't want to, we want to be human. So it's about 40% maximum is GC, so 40. And it actually goes from like 20 to 70. And nothing, nothing beyond that. That's a distribution. Now, if we take our sequence street, and look at the distribution. Distribution is not going to look like that. We have a bias. So if we have our IP, this may be expected. Martin already alluded to this a little bit. If we have a 3K4 ME3 mark, this mark happens predominantly in the promoters of the genes. We know that those locations are GC rich. So our reads will be skewed. So we will have peak looking like this, skewed on the right. But if we have an input, we, do, we don't expect this. We want to see something which resembles our genome, resembles this curve. However, sometimes input looks even like that. So we have shifts on the left. However, input looks like that. So we have different type of biases. And what we are doing, we are correcting on this. We are trying to transform input, or we are using input, transform our data back into the genome. And we believe that GC bias is kind of surrogate for many different biases at different steps. We get the bias, which is converted into bias in DNA. At the end of the day, what we have, we just have sequence. That's it. And this sequence is skewed. Instead of being as expected from randomly, uh, random, at, at genome, we would expect uniformly, right? So, and input, we also would like to expect 
uniformly bias to what I just said, this nucleosome. And of course, with nucleosome, we know that MNA is preferentially cut at AT rich uh, basis, but uh, nevertheless, we would like to expect something which is relatively uniform, like this expectation. So if we normalize our frequency of our process in every bean to the DNA, uh, to the DNA input, we mitigate at least partially this GC bias. That's what we are doing. Um, so here is an example. It's again, it's like kind of I'm like a salesperson, I'm like a little bit, but I'm showing you showing you how it works. So these are a secreting cell acetylation and this results of the fine that it's actually a little bit more fine grade details than, than Max. It gives a little bit more resolution. Now, also comparing to Max, we treat every mark. There is no such thing as punctated or extended. It's just one, one approach. Again, uh, coming from idea or conjecture that the biological process behind histone modification setting is similar. So the writing of histone modification is similar for different parts. Just recruitment to different locations happens. So this is like extended region. So that's available from this website. And you have it in your, in your slides if you want to have a look. So now Max2. Uh, Max2 is the most uh, successful tool in the business. And one of the reasons for success, uh, well, it's one of the earliest tools, it highly cited uh, in the literature, and it's also, it's working. It's rather easy to install, and it will run. It is supported. Um, also, one has to be fair that if the data is of a good quality and rather simple, so it works. It just works well if the data is of a good quality as simple. Problem comes when, when the data is more complicated. Uh, Max explicitly assumes a uh, Poisson model for the background. And here, uh, we just have luck that it works. Because background is not Poisson at all for cheap seek. And, we, and it's maybe Poisson in the ideal world. But with these many, many biases, which I mentioned, which are of stochastic, they are, although biases, they are always shifts, right? They're not stati of statistical properties. There's something which is repeats itself. It gives us some kind of shifts in some of the variables. Uh, however, there are so many of them, and they work in different directions. So that at the end of the day, our data is look like it's some stochastic modification happened to it. Um, and we proven multiple times that when we try to take DNA input, for example, assume that it's Poisson, fit Poisson, and the chi-square for that fit is like just very, very bad. Uh, said that, out of 100 data sets, will be one which is perfectly fit by Poisson. So what people were doing, uh, people who are trying to beat Max, what was the approaches, the following? So Max doesn't work. Then let's use uh, negative, uh, let's use negative binomial for the background. Negative binomial is another distribution, which is almost like Poisson, but it has two parameters. Poisson has just one parameter, mean. Mean of the distribution, just one, one value. So if I would like to uh, describe data with Poisson, it just I need one, one value. Negative binomial has two. Of course, when we have two parameters, we can, we have more freedom to describe data, to feed the data. Then, Negative binomial failed. Uh, people introduce more parameters. So that's maybe why uh, we have more than 50 tools published, but they don't last that much because they were tuned. The heuristic, so all of this is heuristic, including Max. Heuristic was not really um, sustainable for the next, the next data set. So Max assumes Poisson. So how Max derives the single Poisson parameter lambda? Uh, there are several modes. So first, Max beans the data. And then it evaluates 
evaluates this parameter lambda. So here I'm talking about this. Defines lambda within uh, using the background, using input, which is subsampled, uh, and using 1k around the location, 5k and 10k, and takes the maximum. So that's kind of conservative, conservative way. Uh, what tells us that statistics maybe is not really uh, exactly there is in order to get so uh, maybe let me step step uh, so we we run a peak color we have our peaks let's say for hdk 4 ME3 we have 50,000 peaks it's a little bit too many we have a p value assigned to hdk 4 ME3 hdk 4 ME3 typically is a promoter of the gene we have our p-value threshold, which is 1%, which is totally good uh, value. If you look to talk to statisticians, this would be recommendation. It's already multiple tested correct, multiple testing corrected. Then we say, hmm, maybe it's, I don't like it. I reduce it 10 to the minus 3. And that's how it works with max. What it suggests to me, it suggests to me that as we should really reduce my p-value that strongly in order to get reasonable amount of enrichment, it means my statistical model was not that, that precise. Yeah. But it's still good quantity because we rank our locations according to this p-value. And it is, we can choose ourselves what, what threshold to use. And that's what everybody is doing. As soon as we described uh, what we do, that's, that's okay. Uh, well, I skip this that Martin already said that very important to take care about the data because it's actually from experience very very hard to save the data these computational tricks we try but we never we never um, and that's a segue to our tutorial so maybe you saw it if they ask me and they ask you anything you don't know just say it's due to epigenetics and people will be happy so any maybe questions before we start to this much more tedious and much more, uh, yeah, kind of, For yes, please. Yes. You mentioned uh, previously that you can't compare two chip-seek data because you don't know the percentage of enrichment or input. Um, is it uh, in the field to actually publish or report that so that wait a sec, wait a sec. So I didn't mention that you can't compare to ChipSeq. We, we are doing this. That's a goal of consortiums. That's a goal of many, many publications. What you cannot do, you cannot compare, for example, IP directly to input. You cannot say, let me look at the promoter of the gene SP1, count number of reads in the, my IP, then count number of reads in the input, compare and say whether this is enrichment or not. This I cannot do. But once you analyze all the data? I analyzed, I can, yes, yes. And this was on, it's, it's, uh, somewhere. There are multiple ways to do this. You can have your IP set one, run through max, have a list of enriched regions, set of peaks, then have another set of peaks for set B, and then do overlap, like with bad tools. Mm -hmm. I have start end for one, start end for another one, and see how many are concordant, how many are unique. But then you have to really think what are you doing. From those are unique, maybe you would like to look at the signals there, and you, and you would like to see those which are unique, maybe they have weakest signal. So it means it's kind of at the edges. So I'm not capturing. So the easy, uh, easy like visualization of this would be the following. I have one HCK4 and a three peak in one data set, maybe something like that in another data set. Here I call a peak, it's like that. In another I call a peak, it's like that. If I overlap those, they give me, yes, they are concordant. If I look at the number of bases, I see, well, almost 30% or 40% are different. But then if I actually look at the signal, I see signal is very weak here. So it just because somewhere my tool has to threshold my data. 
it's, it's a binary. So it's continuous signal which I'm binarizing. And I'm introducing those type of problems. Yes. Right. It's 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 always it's always um, question in hands specific, right? So you are ranking like using, for example, p value in Max or in Finder or in any other tool, in KM's tool. Uh, you will have a score. That's the ideal scenario. You'll have some kind of score, and then you can have for every peak. You can have, you can look at concordance between those scores, yeah. right? And if you see that majority of the peak concordant, then of course you can question those peaks which have, say, rank ten in one data set and rank one million or one million non-realistic, uh, thirty thousand in another data set. They're very very discordant. Uh, so. You can even do kind of differential peak calling using this type of properties, right? If my rank is ranks is very different, people are doing this. Or you can even set your threshold using concordance. If you're replicates, you have two replicates. That's the way to set a threshold. What is a true threshold? As we just said, Max gave you some p-value, but it's almost arbitrary score: ten to the minus three, or ten to the minus four, ten to the minus five. Some people using threshold, which is unrealistic. So it's up to your pro it's your problem. If all your peaks are discordant, then something with your data set. If majority of your peaks are concordant and some are different, that's your differential peaks. Maybe let's start tutorial and we can cover some. Mm -hmm.